so, so I'm Romek and I'm from AV System and I'll be talking about Udash REST, which uh, my uh, colleague David already briefly introduced. So Udash REST is uh, one of the Udash uh, independent modules and it's yet another REST framework. Of course, we are developers, we, we love to reinvent wheels and one of the most reinvented wheels in the programming world are REST frameworks. Uh, the other one probably being the JSON libraries, um, which we also have one of our own because we love to invent, reinvent things. And so Udash REST, uh, you can think of it as an extension of Udash RPC because it looks very similar as a, um, uh, it looks very similar on the purpose, uh, on the surface. It uses the same underlying metaprogramming engine as RPC. So there's a, there's a lot of shared code, like all, all the heavy bits are shared between RPC and REST. And it's, the easy parts are the parts uh, which are actually, dif uh, which are actually uh, different between these two modules. And so we can use U-REST rest in place of the standard, R standard RPC. Um, and of course, it is an independent, li independent library, so you don't have to use uh, the entire UDash framework in order to, in order to use, use uh, u REST. You can use it as a pure REST library, regardless if you have uh, Scala.js or Scala.jvm, you, you can have both the client and the server uh, on any platform without uh, using the REST of u pun intended. Okay, so uh, this is the situation with RPC. RPC serves the purpose of um, establishing a typed interface between the client and the server in Udash application. And uh, it serves this purpose very well, but there's one problem with this. Uh, the network protocol between the client and the server is kind of opaque. So it can't really be consumed by other systems, uh, for example, written in other languages. So this is what uh, REST solves. Uh, in REST, we, um, the communication between the client and the server, which is also based on traits, as you're going to see soon, uh, this communication is well defined because it's now uh, an HTTP request and responses, and we can control how these uh, requests and responses look like. And we also have open API generation from the traits which define the API. And uh, thanks to this open API, we can consume this uh, API uh, from other languages. Uh, we, can cons we can, because there are many tools that generate uh, client code and server stubs in other languages. So for, for instance, we can have a TypeScript client, a Java client, and other stuff. We also get uh, an interactive documentation for free with Swagger UI, which I'm going to show an example later. And um, actually, it's even possible uh, with a bit of glue code, but it's even possible to use, uh, to use uh, these REST traits from uh, other JVM languages uh, than Scala directly, like without the open API, without going uh, through the code generation. It requ requires some glue code, mostly because um, Scala features are not very friendly to Java code, but it can be done. So usually, um, these typed REST interfaces, uh, we put them in a separate artifact, which we can publish, and then clients uh, written in various JVM languages can reuse that. OK, so this is like very simplistic example of how you would define a REST trait. So we have like uh, some crude API with, with only the C part implemented. We have the create user. And uh, you can also see that I've also defined uh, the data, data types which are used by, by the trait. We have uh, the user case class and I've also uh, introduced user ID because this is, uh, this is a good uh, practice in Scala to uh, wrap um, these primitive types into more meaning, to give them more meaningful names and to gain uh, type safety and more readable, more readable code. So we have, uh, we have a user ID, which is actually a value class. And, and then this user ID uh, we use in the user. And then uh, 
when I'm going to show the open API, you're going to see how, how we can benefit from it. OK. Um, as you can see, uh, we've defined companion objects for the trait and also for the data types. And uh, this companion object extends some magic classes. And these magic classes are actually very important. Uh, actually, they determine how all this thing works. Uh, they are crucial here. Um, they accept uh, a magic hidden parameter, a super constructor parameter, which is an implicit. And then imp this implicit is macro generated. So this is where all the heavy stuff goes. All the heavy stuff goes. Um, so actually, uh, you would be surprised that this code, which contains like uh, only a few lines, is actually going to generate a lot more code uh, in, the, in the generated code, in the bytecode or Scala.js. Uh, but that's what it's all about. It's all the code that, that the compiler writes for us, so we don't have to write it on our own. Um, and uh, these magic parameters, they contain some type class instances, uh, which make uh, which make, um, make it possible to expose this trait as REST endpoint and generate a client for it. And they are all uh, macro generated, which means that there's some heavy compile time reflection going on. OK, so this is how the server looks like. So as you can see, we have a very simplistic implementation. Uh, so we just simply have to create a class which implements our trait. And then when we have our class, then we, with, a, with a very simple single line, we can wrap it in, in a servlet. And when we have a servlet, then we can, of course, put it in whatever servlet container we want to use. So as you can see, this is very simple. And then on the client side, <coughs> uh, so the default client implementation that we provide in Udash is based on STTP library, which is a library uh, by Software Mill. And here we can, as you can see, we create a client which takes, uh, which takes the, the address of the server. We tell it what, what is the type of, of our API, what is the type of the trait, and we magically get an actual instance of this trait. And this, this instance is actually a macro-generated proxy. Um, when we call methods on it, then it's, uh, then it's actually going to perform um, network communication with the server. So here we, we call this method called create user with a thread parameter. Uh, and because it's a future, we can uh, apply some callback on it and react on the result. OK, and this is what we're going to see on the network. So as you can see, um, this method call generated a post request. And po that's because the post request uh, is the default one. So I'm really showing you uh, what are the defaults uh, in the interpretation of this REST trait. So the, by default, every method is interpreted as post because this is, this is the safest uh, option. Because for instance, a get method cannot have, uh, have a body. So we decided that it would be the, the most reasonable thing to, to make post the default one. And as you can also see, the method name got appended to the request path. And this is also, this is everything uh, about, this, uh, about this format is customizable. Uh, uh, there are some annotations which can control that, which I'm going to show later. Uh, the parameter itself uh, got interpreted, got interpreted uh, as, a, as a field of JSON body, which will be sent uh, in this request. If we had more of these parameters, then of course the object would, be, uh, would have more of these fields. And in the response, we get a simple JSON object, which is essentially a serialized user. OK, so how does this actually work? So there are two steps that make this work. On the server side, we have an implementation of our trait, user API impl. And the macros magically transform this implementation into something that we call handle request, which is essentially just an asynchronous function from a request to a response. We use some raw form of asynchronous here. We don't use future here. That's because we want to be independent of, 
of future. So it's a bit uh, low level code. That's, what, that's why uh, we have uh, also a, a quite low level representation of these asynchronous computations. Uh, you can just imagine that instead of async, you have something like a future or a task or something like this. So essentially, a handle request is, um, is a asynchronous function from a request to a response. And everything here in these requests and responses is already serialized. So this is, uh, this is ready to send through network. And when we have this handle request, then we have to actually write some manual code and, and actually turn it into a um, working network endpoint. So I said manually because, well, REST servlet is a default implementation, so we provide it, but you can make your own implementations. You can plug in your own backends. If you don't want to use a servlet, you, uh, you have some specific uh, HTTP server that you want to use. Like, for instance, you can directly use Jetty, which doesn't need to use servlets. It has some more low-level um, uh, abstractions. Then, uh, then you have to manually Hand, uh, wrap this handle request function into a network endpoint, but this is this is uh, this is not a lot of work. Like if you looked at the implementation of REST servlet, it's like less than less than 100 lines of code. It mostly, it's just about tr uh, converting between these request and response representation between REST framework and uh, HTTP server uh, native representations. Uh, so you've got these two steps, and the, the important part here is that the backend is pluggable, so it so we can uh, you can implement your own easily, and uh, like it ha it has been designed from from the start to make this possible. And then on the client, you have uh, pretty much the same, but with reversed order. Um, first, you have some native HTTP client because you have your favorite HTTP client library. And then what you have to do manually is you have to turn this client into handler request function, function which is pretty much the same amount of work as, um, as turning a uh, handler request into a servlet. So this is also mostly about uh, uh, transforming those representations of requests and responses and handling some asynchronous calls. And then when we have the handler request function, then again, with, with a single line using all this macro generated stuff, we can magically turn this handle request into a user API proxy. And so we can call nicely typed uh, methods on the client side. And how we can affect the format of, uh, how we can affect the format of, of, uh, of what's actually on the wire of HTTP requests and responses. So there's a bunch of annotations. Uh, the most important ones are those who, which choose the HTTP method that will be used for each uh, trait method. So here we can see that uh, uh, we got another method which fetches a user by its ID and we annotate this as get and thanks to that on the wire we're going to see a HTTP get call. And one difference between get and other methods is that uh, parameters of get methods are interpreted as query parameters rather than body parameters, as it was done with post in the previous example. Uh, so the request will, will look like this. Okay. So um, how can we customize uh, this trait with annotations? So of course these uh, HTTP method annotations, which I have already mentioned. There's also a prefix annotation, uh, which is kind of weird. I'm going to talk about this later. Uh, we can customize paths because by default, as, as I mentioned, the method name is getting uh, appended to the URL path that's being sent in the request. We can customize it. We can give uh, arbitrary path segment that will be used instead of the method name. We can even use an empty path, which is actually useful sometimes. I'm going to show an example later. And finally, um, we can annotate parameters to tell that we want some parameter to be interpreted as path parameter, header parameter, 
query parameter or body parameters. Like some of these are the defaults, like for instance, for, for the post method, the body is the default, for get method, uh, the query is the default. Uh, we're missing on cookies right now. No cookies, we don't accept cookies. Uh, but we will accept them in the future. And finally, uh, there are some other annotations which control how the body is being built. So the default one is JSON body. So this is what was done in the first example. The field uh, parameters of the post method got all serialized into a single JSON body, uh, JSON object uh, sent in, in the body. We can also use form body. And finally, we have custom body. And custom body methods accept exactly one parameter. And then we have a full control over how this parameter is being serialized into a body. So, uh, so we can do uh, whatever media type we want. OK, so this looks suspiciously similar to the solutions that we are used to from the Java world. Like most of the Scala developers come from the Java world. And we have some nightmares from, from these times. And probably um, some of these nightmares are related to all these frameworks which use interfaces with annotations. Uh, so U-REST looks suspicious, suspiciously similar to that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to you to convince that uh, in Scala we can do much better than that. So what are the problems in Java uh, for solutions like, for example, JAX-RS, which is like the, the, the standardized solution for defining REST interfaces in Java using, using Java interfaces with annotations? So uh, the most important problem about these solutions is the usage of runtime reflection. Like, Pretty much all the other problems are the consequence of that, because runtime reflection means that if anything is wrong, we're going to know about this in runtime. Like the compiler, com com the compiler doesn't help us at all. It doesn't catch the most common simple errors. Uh, so runtime proxies, OK, so this is pretty much in the same category as runtime reflection. Uh, annotations are very, very limited. and Later, I will show you that, well, in Scala, we can do much better about, uh, we can work with annotations much better than in Java. Uh, there's Java serialization, which is probably another source of nightmares, uh, also because of runtime reflection. So these annotations actually form an ad hoc, ty dynamically typed pseudo language, which is very hard to use and to debug. And also, async support in Java, also not the greatest one. So in Scala, we can do better. Because first of all, we use compile time reflection with macros. We can do all sorts of crazy stuff there. And by all sorts of crazy stuff there, I don't mean like things that the user won't understand, but just the opposite. We can help the user with what we can do with, uh, within macros. This especially is about. Uh, error messages. So we have type class based serialization, which is like this pretty much at this point, the accepted solution for serialization in Scala. There, there are multiple libraries uh, for serialization, especially for JSON. And they are pretty much all based on type classes, uh, which are, um, which are uh, usually derived by macros for case classes and sealed characters. Um, so we have much better support for asynchronous computations. We have various effects. We have the future, which is not the greatest, but it's still way better than the Java future. We have all sorts of other IO monad implementations, Monix task. Uh, so they are being created. Uh, like many people redo that thing. So we have uh, a lot to choose from. And because macros work at compile time and generate code, uh, we are completely independent of the platform. We don't care about, for instance, type erasure in Java. We don't care about the fact that reflection, runtime reflection is not available in Scala.js. Uh, macros do their work in compilation, and we don't care about, about the target platform. So, so this, is, this means that. Uh, uh, U-REST will work equally good in JVM and JS. Uh, readable precise error messages, so uh, I have already mentioned it. Since we're doing macros, we can customize uh, error messages from the compiler. Uh, 
And this is really a power, very, very powerful tool. It determines good uh, developer experience. This is especially important because if we're doing a lot of macros, we don't want the user to have to read those macros and understand them. So our error message, messages need, need to be very, very good quality. And finally, we can do a much better annotation processing. Um, have, uh, I have some separate slides about that, so we're going to see. All right. Um, Prefix methods or getters. So David already mentioned when he was talking about user RPC, he mentioned that some of the methods in the, in the trait might return another trait. And we have the same situation in REST. We can define so-called prefix methods. And uh, they are good in order to organize your API because you can just split your big API into separate interfaces. And that, then you can compose them into a larger interface, uh, which returns these sub-interfaces from methods. So you can see an, an example here. We have uh, this top-level trait, and it has two sub-traits, which are entry points to sub-APIs. And uh, prefix methods contribute to URL path. So for instance, uh, with this example, users and groups would, uh, uh, would be appended to the URL, but we can also customize this with prefix annotation. And, uh, and here, as I'm going to show in a minute, giving an empty path can be very beneficial. Uh, because the other uh, use case for prefix methods is to capture so, some common parameters, some common data that we want to extract from the request before, uh, before we do the actual work. And uh, I think the most canoni canonical example of that would be authentication. Uh, so what we have here is a system API, which is pretty much the, the root API. It's, it's, uh, it's the business API. And then we need to handle authentication. Uh, we assume that uh, we're going to get a header authorization. I don't know why, why the header for authentication is called authorization. Never mind. But it's called like that. Um, and uh, we can handle this with a prefix method. So we create another trait which encloses our system API. And this enclosing trait has a single method which declares a single header parameter. And, and as you can see, it has empty path, which means that it will not affect uh, how, the request, how the request looks like on the network. So this way we can separate concerns have uh, authentication in a completely separate layer than the rest of our API. Default parameter values. So of course, in Scala, as you probably know, uh, all the parameters can have default values, which look like this. And the REST framework takes advantage of this. Be, uh, first of all, um, uh, this is very good for interface evolution because if you want to add a parameter to your, to your REST method and you're worrying about the breaki breaking uh, backwards compatibility, then you can declare a new parameter and give it a default value. And this, this default value will be picked by the macro engine and it will be used during deserialization as the fallback value if this parameter is actually missing on the network. Uh, there's also a when absent annotation, which pretty much does the same thing, except uh, except um, uh, we have better control over what's happening in here because uh, our intention might be to provide a fallback value for deserialization, but we don't want it to be uh, a default value for the actual programmer's API. So this way, using this when absent annotation, we can actually define fallback value, which is only for deserialization, nothing more. Uh, there's also a combination of these two, when we can say when absent and also, and also extract this when absent annotation with this. This is a macro, which, oh, OK, so that, that's a dirty trick, uh, because that macro actually just takes out uh, this value f from this annotation. And it's all about not having to repeat this value uh, twice. Um, why would we use that? 
Um, mainly because when absent annotations is picked up by open API generation, unfortunately the, the standard default value is not picked up by open API for some technical reasons which I don't want to explain. So okay, speaking of open API, uh, for those who don't know, uh, open API is a specification for describing rest endpoints endpoints with JSON or YAML. And it's I think it's currently gaining a lot of a lot of track, um, a lot of uh, interest. Um, and there's a lot of tooling uh, being created for open API. And pretty much every new REST framework that you're going to see being developed supports automatic generation of open API. And so, do, so we, we also do this. Um, what do we get from open API? We get interactive documentation, for, for instance, with Swagger UI, which is the, the most popular tool for that. Uh, there are also others. And finally, we can generate a client, client code and server step code, uh, which allows us to consume this API in other languages than Scala. So this is how we can generate open API from uh, uh, u-rest trait. We access something called open API metadata. We give it some additional information parameters which are required by open API. And then we obtain the open API object. So we have a case class representation for all the open API specification objects, which means that we can programmatically modify this open API before actually serializing it into JSON or YAML. And finally, the, the last line just writes the, the JSON of, of the open API. And open API can be customized, and this is also done with annotations because, of course, um, it contains all of documentation, so, so there are stuff like summaries, descriptions, titles, all the stuff that a human need to work, uh, a human need to write. So this is not available from just pure, uh, from just pure signatures. So we have to somehow, um, somehow we have to include that information. So we do it with these annotations. It's pretty much self-explanatory. And we can also do the same thing for data types, not only, not only for interfaces. So here we have a case class, and we put some description on this case class, some example, uh, a description of field, and so on. And finally, here's an example of how this interactive documentation looks like. This is Swagger UI. Uh, so it looks pretty nicely, and I want to point out that as you can see in the schemas, we have the user ID schema. So this is, so this is the benefit of using a wrapper type for user ID. We get it automatically in, the, in this documentation. So it's much more readable and clear for the user and he knows exactly what this parameter is. Okay, so the next Big topic is serialization because we, of course, uh, all these parameters and the results of these methods in a trait need to be serialized, and it's it's good to explain how this actually happens. So we have this uh, concept of row and real values. So essentially, uh, in the field of serialization, row values are the ones that we serialize into, and in uh, in the REST framework, we have like the four main row values that. Uh, that real values might get serialized into. We have the JSON value, plain value, HTTP body address response. And of course, these real values are those actual values which we use in the traits. Uh, it's all the business types, case classes and stuff. And so what the macro actually does when it sees, when it sees a parameter in a trait. So it needs to find a way to serialize a parameter. So we have two type classes, which, is, which are called as row and as real. And uh, they're pretty much conversions between row and real. So if we have, for instance, a trait like this, the macro sees user ID, and it's a path parameter, which means that uh, it's going to be serialized into plain value. And so the macro looks for an implicit of as row plain value user ID or as real plain value user ID, depending on whether we are on the client or the server. Similarly, for body parameter, we look for JSON value serialization. And, and for the result, 
we decompose it into two stages. We have uh, a REST response serialization for the user, and we, we also have a separate type class for handling, handling asynchronous uh, asynchronicity, uh, which is called async effect. So these are the type classes that the macro looks for when it interprets the trait. And now these, these type classes don't have default instances. The idea is here that you have to plug in your own implementation of implementations of these, uh, of these uh, type class instances. So for instance, if you want to use Cirque as, uh, as the default, uh, uh, as the serialization library for JSON, which is probably the most popular library in Scala for JSON, then what you have to do is you have to take an encoder from JSON and turn it into an as row for JSON value. And similarly for decoded, you have to uh, turn it into as real. Um, then you have to make your own version of one of these base companion classes uh, that I shown uh, that I have shown in the in, in the example. Um, you remember that there was default REST API companion used, and this one injects GAN codec. So if you want to use some other library, you have to make your own, but it's been designed so that it's fairly easy to, to do this. So you don't have to write a lot. It's just pretty much a matter of writing relatively small amount of, uh, of boilerplate, which is, not, uh, which is not very harmful. Um, so this is one of the main points of extensibility of, of this framework. You can plug in your own serialization as long as it is based on type classes. Now you can also plug in your own asynchronous effects or your favorite IO monad library because this is all controlled by this async effect type class, which is pretty much just a bidirectional conversion between this raw async thing, which is and pretty much a consumer of a callback, and, and your favorite IO monad or task or whatever. So it's easy to provide uh, to provide uh, support for, for whatever async effect you want to use. And again, future is actually injected by default REST API companion. So, so the default means gen codec plus features. Um, so in other words, uh, the REST framework in itself is uh, agnostic about being purely functional or not. The point is, if you want to use a purely functional style, you can. It's just a matter of providing these uh, base companion classes which are tailored for your particular need. You can even do crazy stuff like this, which is a trait parameterized by, by the effect. So we have an effect polymorphic trait. This is something that you might have seen in the tagless final thing. And as you can see, you can also turn this, turn this thing into a REST IP trait. This might be useful, for instance, because you can have, I don't know, you, you might want to have a blocking implementation on the server, and then you might want to have a asynchronous client or something like this. So, so you can do like weird combinations like that. And uh, also a very important thing is that writing these base companion classes is fairly easy. So if there's something slightly different here that you want to support, I know you, you want to accept another type parameter in your trait, then you can make a base companion class which will handle exactly that, that case which you have in your application. So it's pretty generic and, and extensible. And now about compilation errors. Of course, there's a, uh, there's a fairly complex metaprogramming, metaprogramming engine running uh, beneath REST framework. There's a lot of macros and we don't want the user to have to understand those, so it's very important to provide him very readable error messages. And for instance, what is, what is the most common error that, uh, what is the most common mistake that we can make while writing the trade? We can, the most common mistake is probably forgetting about providing serialization. So for instance, we have this method which accepts user as, as the body of, of, a, of a method, and suppose we forgot to write a companion for it. So there's no gen codec available in, in this case, or in general, uh, 
type class instance for serialization. So the macro will, uh, will yield this compilation message. The most important f part about this is that you can notice that, you can notice that this message is, uh, is, uh, has a location has a location on the parameter. Okay, so, uh, so we are being pointed straight into the source of the problem. If this was in IDE, like IntelliJ, you would double click the error and it would navigate you to the user parameter. So, uh, so you, you immediately know where the problem comes from. And the message itself also explains it pretty uh, extensively. We have problem with parameter user of method replace user, and then we have this chain of I implicit uh, explained because there are implicit dependencies. Uh, the macro complains that it cannot deserialize user from HTTP body, and now it tells us because it cannot deserialize the user from JSON value because no gen codec is available. And there's, there's, uh, uh, there's some interesting solution that we have for that to work because the Scala compiler itself is not very good at uh, displaying good error messages for implicit not found, for, for a situation where an implicit cannot be found. So we've come up with a weird thing that looks like this. It looks scary, but it does its job. So first of all, we have a uh, regular implicit, which pretty much, pretty much mm, turns a serialization of JSON value into a serialization of HTTP body. Because of course, if we can serialize something into JSON, then we can assume that we can serialize this as body. We just put an application JSON contents type and we're happy. So this implicit ex expresses this relation between those serializers. And now the problem is that when Scala compiler doesn't, is unable to find this implicit, it no, longer, it no longer follows this dependency and it doesn't explain the root cause of why this implicit cannot be found. And because of that, we've made some extensions because of course we are looking for these implicits from macros. So we can know when an implicit cannot be found and then we can do again some crazy stuff in macros to customize it to our needs. And so we define uh, another implicit, which looks like the previous one, except it has the types wrapped in implicit not found phantom thing. And uh, this actually expresses a relation between implicit not found error messages for these type classes. Okay, so this is, this is where it comes from. As you can see, we refer to this for JSON parameter, which in this case represents the implicit not found error message for JSON value. Okay, so this way we can actually explain these implicit dependencies dependencies in uh, compilation error messages, so that the user uh, is pointed to the actual root cause of the problem. In this case, th this would be no gen codec found for user because this is the real problem here that there's no gen codec. Okay, uh, and finally, annotation processing. So in Java, the situation is bad because they are processed all in runtime. They are type unsafe. They are very limited because they can contain only primitive values, enums, strings, and arrays of these. So uh, not a lot we can, we can put in there. So pretty much everything more complex we have to encode as strings, which is not very good. Um, they can have methods. Uh, they are not classes. Uh, it's very hard to reuse annotations. We often find ourselves in a situation where when we have the same set of annotations repeated uh, over and over, and they are, they are also limited by Java type erasure. What we can do in Scala to make this better? First of all, Scala annotations are completely unrelated to Java annotations. They have nothing to do with them. They are actual classes, so they can do everything that classes can do. They have constructors, they have methods, they can inherit from traits, implement interfaces, do everything that normal classes can do. Uh, there are no limitations of uh, what can be a parameter of, of a Scala annotation. We can take arbitrary types there. And um, 
annotations are accessible to macros, which means that uh, in macro we can pretty much build our own annotation processing engine, and that's what we've done. So first of all, we can uh, look, up uh, look up annotations by type, by like a full type, because for, for instance, we can have an uh, annotation which is generic, or we can look up annotations by some base type, some, uh, some, uh, some interface that the set of annotations implements. And also a very important thing is that annotations uh, in Scala are seen by macros are as abstract syntax trees, that is a ASTs, of a constructor call of that annotation. Okay, so when a macro inspects, inspects an annotation, it, it sees a constructor call for this annotation. And this constructor call, it can take it and then it can, it can bring it into runtime. Or it can, it can put it into uh, the macro generated code. And because of that, we can then access this annotation in runtime. And uh, the good thing about this is that we can only bring into runtime these annotations which we actually need. Not all annotations, like, like in Java. Or, okay, there, there's some, we can, uh, we have some influence because we can, we can say that the annotation in Java is runtime or not, but in macros we can decide with much more precision. And this is actually very important for dead code elimination in Scala.js, that we only bring th this, these metadatas which are important for us. And so a very important feature that we've developed is aggregation, which I'm going to show soon. OK, so first of all, uh, let's go back to the example with uh, uh, customizing open API. So we had the summary annotation on the method. And now the, the, the important thing about this is that if we look at, at the definition of this annotation, then we're going to see that it's just an implementation of something called operation adjuster. So operation is an object that appears in the open API uh, document that, that describes our, our API. And operation adjuster is simply represents some arbitrary modification to that operation object. In this case, this is simply adding the summary field, right? So the point is that the macro, uh, this metaprogramming engine doesn't care about summary. It simply cares about operation adjusters. That means we can create these annotations by ourselves. You can, we can create our own annotations, which simply implements this operation adjuster. There are also other adjusters like schema adjuster. Uh, so there are a few of these adjusters for various types of objects which appear in the open API specification. So this is a very extensible mechanism. We can customize it uh, very, very freely, if you can say like this. And also, uh, it also means that the metaprogramming meta engine is, uh, is actually simple under the hood because it only cares about these base interfa interfaces, these adjusters, not actual annotations like summary. And finally, uh, dry, which is of course, don't repeat yourself. Uh, this is a problem which is very hard to solve in Java. In Scala, because we can do crazy stuff in macros, we can do better. Uh, so here we have a situation when we, uh, where we have to put, this, put the, same the same set of annotations on in multiple places. So we repeat ourselves, in, in other words. And uh, we don't want that, so how can we avoid this? We can create something called annotation aggregate, which is essentially a custom annotation, which is supposed to aggregate a bunch of other annotations. And uh, okay, this looks kind of weird because there's some type implied, which is a fake type member. Um, the whole point of this is to be able to define these aggregated annotations inside the class, inside the body of the, of the uh, aggregate, annotation aggregate itself, because this gives us uh, an ability to to forward parameters. As you can see, we, the annotation aggregate accepts a path parameter, and we can pass the path, uh, 
you can pass this parameter to aggregated annotations. So here we reuse this path as the, as the parameter of put annotation. And well, maybe this example is not very representative, but it's definitely like the benefits of it are much more clear if there's more of these annotations. Like for instance, you can, there could be some open API customizing annotations in here. So, so in, in other words, we have, uh, we have a mechanism for code reuse in, in the area of annotations, which is something very lacking in, in Java world. Uh, okay, and I suppose that's probably all I got. So in summary, um, uh, Yudosh REST is still um, mostly recommended for situations where you need, uh, the first thing you need is an RPC for the client and server. And then um, you might run into some problems with it if you want the network traffic look exactly like some particular form. Like if you have to cover some external, uh, some external service with REST traits, then you can do it, but sometimes you might run into some limitations. So the primary use case for, for you dash REST is to establish RPC, well-typed RPC, which can also be consumed by other systems. Uh, okay, I guess that would be all. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, thanks again.